Hey, thank you very much. So yes, I am Nevin Villani. I will be talking about tree borrows, which is the result of joint work with Ralph Jung and Derek Drake. And let's start right away with an example so I can show you what we're working with. Put yourselves in the shoes of a compiler. You see some function, and this function takes a mutable reference as an argument. It calls some other code that you don't have access to, but you can reason locally about mutable references because mutable references provide exclusive access, right? So since this write access here on line 32 is just writing back the value that was just read previously, and since we have exclusive access to X, we know that the unknown function does not modify it, we expect the following optimization, which is to remove the right access, to not change the behavior of the program in any way. Our program is now faster because we've, we're doing fewer operations. We test our program and it fails. That's a problem. So what's happening here? If we undo the optimization, um, the program passes tests. So this means that somehow our reasoning of exclusive ownership of mutable references was flawed. We apparently don't have exclusive access to um, data behind a mutable reference, which is, which is a problem. We should be able to use this data to optimize programs. What happens here is that the exclusivity of mutable references is a type level information. And unfortunately, if we look at the implementation of opaque, which breaks our assumptions, it uses unsafe code. And unsafe code is a way to bypass the type system. So the compiler is using type system information to do local optimizations. And unsafe violates the rules of the type system. So unsafe can break optimizations. How do we resolve this? Ideally, we'd want to have both unsafe and um, good optimizations, right? So what's happening here, we can do optimizations based on type information. Unsafe breaks the reliability of type information. So these optimizations are, in appearance, incompatible with unsafe. We don't want to give up on them. So let's introduce undefined behavior. If you break the assumptions of the type system, it is your fault. It is not the compiler's job to worry about that. A bit more formally, we define an alternative semantics for Rust that makes it so that any program that violates the rules of the type, of the type system in a predefined way will exhibit undefined behavior. And a program that exhibits undefined behavior can be compiled in any way that the compiler um, was. It is not invalid for the compiler to miscompile code that contains UB. Of course, we have to use this tool carefully. In this specific case, this is a case of pointer aliasing undefined behavior. The undefined behavior occurs because we have created a pointer to some piece of data that should not have any pointers to. In this specific case, we've accessed the data behind a mutable reference, where when the mutable reference should have access, exclusive access. There are many other kinds of undefined behavior, but we are going in this talk to focus only on pointer erasing undefined behavior. So this is the rule of tree and stacked borrows. Tree and stacked borrows define um, an operational semantics with undefined behavior of memory accesses. They are also implemented in order to detect these um, violations of the, um, of, the, of the typing rules. And this enables us to perform compiler optimizations because we can rule out all patterns that alias in wrong ways um, from the correctness check of optimizations. And we can justify LLVM attributes. This is because LLVM does its own aliasing assumptions on pointer that we give it. And so 
for Rust to properly use LLVM optimizations, it needs to provide at least the same level of assumptions. In particular, two attributes that we're interested in are no alias, which provides some guarantee of exclusive access, and dereferenceable, which provides a guarantee that you are allowed to dereference a pointer. So Mary is an interpreter that detects UV and trains stack burrows, which I will explain a bit more in detail right, right afterwards, are um, implemented in Miri. And so Miri is able to detect violations of train stack borrows uh, aliasing assumptions. If we go back to our code example and we run it under Miri, Miri will flag this program as containing undefined behavior because a write access inside an unsafe block violates some exclusivity assumptions of some mutable reference. I don't expect you all to know about stacked borrows. So here's a, here are the basics. Stacked borrows comes from the observation that correct use of mutable references is well nested. So all mutable references should follow a stack discipline in when we use them and when we create them. So for each memory location and each pointer, stack borrows tracks um, its what permissions it has to access the specific location. It uses identifiers to dif differentiate between pointers, and it stores these identifiers in a stack. When you do a reborrow, you create a new identifier, you push this identifier to the stack. When you want to use a pointer, you check that its identifier is in the stack and you pop everything above. This will invalidate the incompatible pointers and this will enforce that mutable references are used in a well parenthesized manner. Here's how a typical execution of stacked borrows will run. A creation of a new allocation creates a new stack. And when we reborrow, we're, we do two things. First, we check that the pointer we reborrow from is in the stack. It is. And then we create a new identifier for the newly created pointer and push it to the stack. If we reborrow again, we check that the value we reborrow from is in the stack. We pop everything above. In this case, we pop Y from the stack. And we push the newly created pointer. We push Z. And then when we try to use Y, Y is no longer inside the stack. And so this program is declared to have undefined behavior under stacked borrows. So stacked borrows correctly detects this piece of code as violating an assumption of exclusive ownership of mutable references. That's great. Stacked borrows enables a lot of optimizations. The problem is, Stack borrows is a bit too strict. If tomorrow um, optimizations were rolled out that use stacked borrows assumptions, all of these crates I've listed here, including Tokyo, Pi 3, and so on, would be uh, backwards incompatible with the changes because they contain undefined behavior according to stacked borrows. So stack borrows is so strict uh, as to not let us properly use uh, unsafe without major dangers. Here's, whenever we discuss about UB, here's an essential trade-off to keep in mind. If you have more UB, you can make stronger assumptions about the code you see. And stronger assumptions means stronger optimizations. However, more UB is also more rules that the user must ensure they satisfy. Because if the user violates one of these rules, their code might be miscompiled. Because UB, the responsibility of UB is deferred to the user, if there's too much UB in the language, the users are not going to like that. So we'd like a model like stack borrows, but with less UB and easier rules. Here is an intuition of why stacked borrows is too strict 
and also it shows how we're going to fix it. Let's say we have this pointer. And this pointer contains at the top the four identifiers of a, a stack. And the stack contains at the top the four identifiers of the four pointers A, B, C, D. Now, what does that tell us about the code that could produce these pointers? What does that tell us about the assumptions we can make about this code? Well, it turns out that stacked borrows cares more about the order in which you created pointers than about their exact relationship with each other. So whether you we borrow B, C, and D all from A, which is the middle block, or if you reborrow them as a chain, each from the previous one, um, stack borrows will not differentiate between these two patterns. And all of the and both of these, all three of these really, will be represented by the same stack. And this is unfortunate because we're losing key information in the precise structure of the reborrows that we're working on. So by essence, because stack, a stack has only one dimension to store information in, it loses a lot of important in information. What's our solution to that? We extend the stack into a tree, but a tree is a stack is basically a tree, but with only one branch. So in comes tree borrows. Tree borrows generalizes the observation of stack borrows by instead of saying that mutable references follow a stack discipline, we observe that all pointers follow a tree discipline. And then we just mostly replace the stack operations with tree operations. So instead of pushing new pointers to the stack, we add them as leaves of the tree. Instead of um, popping pointers above, we invalidate their permissions um, when they are not um, below in the tree. So that's the basic motivation for tree borrows and the general idea of how it generalizes on stack borrows to be more permissive. I will now go into a bit more into detail with how tree borrows works exactly. First of all, we're going to need to specify something that a lot of specifications um, leave vague. So the LLVM and Rust specifications talk about other pointers. And for example, in the context of when you own immutable reference, you know that other pointers will not have access to the data you own. We need to formalize what other pointers means a bit more precisely. So it's now well established in Rust that a pointer is not just an address, it's also a size. And what tree and stack borrowers say is that it's also a unique identifier. So in our model, pointers also carry around this additional piece of data. This is not present at runtime, it is only within uh, the model. And two pointers, even if they point to the same data and even if they have the same size, they will not be equal in the eyes of tree and stack borrows if they have different identifiers. So we now know how we identify our pointers. Let's see how we store them in a tree. Um, essentially, the tree structure is pretty easy to map to the um, code that produces it. If you create a new allocation with a pointer x to it, this will create a new the root of a new tree with x at its root. If you reborrow um, pointers from each other, it will create new leaves of the tree as children of the pointer you reborrowed from. Sometimes pointers might have the same um, identifier, and this is how we encode raw pointers. Raw pointers are just considered to be the same as their parent reference. Sometimes reborrows are not implicit. They do not necessarily have an ampersand star symbol before them. In general, whenever you use a mutable reference as a function argument, for example, it will create a reborrow. For example, here W1 does not appear in the source code. It's created implicitly uh, by the caller when we uh, pass X to a function. And similarly, on function entry, a reborrow occurs. So in general, 
Whenever you do a reborrow, you create a new identifier and you push it at a, as a leaf of the pointer you created it from. So our tree stores identifiers. It doesn't just store identifiers. We also store some structure between these identifiers, in this case, the hierarchy of reborrows. And more importantly, we also store a permission for each identifier. And this permission tells us what we are allowed to do with this pointer. Are we allowed to read? Are we allowed to write? Whenever we do an access through a pointer, um, tree borrows will see an access through some identifiers, through some tag. It will check that the tag has sufficient permissions and will update the permissions in the rest of the tree to reflect that an access occurs and properly detect a violation of conflicts between future accesses and the one that just occurred. So permission is the memory of tree borrow so that it keeps track of what accesses are incompatible with each other. Tree borrows distinguishes two kinds of accesses. Child accesses occur through child pointers. So pointers on the node or below a node. This is all in reference to one specific pointer. And foreign accesses are everything that is not a child access. This includes parents and reborrows of parents. And each access can be a read or a write. So the core machinery of tree borrows will keep track of permissions. And whenever a foreign read, foreign write, child read, or child write occurs, it will update the permissions. If you know LLVM, um, the, the LLVM term is a pointer being based on another pointer, and this is exactly the same as child pointers. Uh, a pointer Y is a child of X, exactly in the same circumstances that uh, Y is based on X. Here's one simple example. We have X, a pointer to some unknown data. We don't necessarily know the entirety of the tree. And we have y reborrowed from x. An access through x is above y in the tree, so it is a foreign access for y. It is on or below x, so it is a child access for x. An access through y is on or below y, so it is a child access for y, and it is on or below x, so it is a child access for x. Any access through some part of the tree that we don't know about will be a foreign access for both. So I've shown pointers in a tree. Each pointer has a permission and um, we create new, uh, we extend the tree when we create new pointers through reborrows and we track permissions to know which accesses are allowed at which time. Now that we have this high level structure of child foreign accesses and reborrows that extend the tree, let's zoom in on the level of permissions. So how many permissions are we going to need? The short answer is you want one permission for each different kind of behavior that you expect from a pointer. We try to keep the number of permissions to a minimum, but in general, um, if the model is found to be insufficiently precise, it works well to add new permissions and reason about how they should interact. Here, the behavior of the pointer includes a lot of things. It includes whether it should allow mutability, it includes whether its lifetime is currently, um, whether we're currently in its lifetime or if it has ended. It includes some information about when it was created. So really, kind of pointers is anytime you want two different types of pointers to behave differently, you give them different permissions. And the guarantees that we expect of these pointers determine how those permissions should evolve. For example, here's the general reason. If we want our pointer to allow mutation, so this could be a mutable reference, it could be a shared reference with intermutability, it could be a raw mutable pointer. But in general, if we want the pointer to allow mutation, it must tolerate in some way that is not trigger UB, child rights. Because a child rights, a child right is a right through the pointer. So if you want the pointer to allow right accesses, you must allow child rights. 
If your pointer is to guarantee some form of uniqueness, it must reject foreign accesses because everything that is foreign is a violation of you owning the data exclusively. And so if the real pointer needs to guarantee exclusivity, it will trigger undefined behavior when a foreign access occurs. Here's, here's how we start. Um, we're going to use the, the, the base triplet of, of tree borrows that most pointers can be represented with, and that is active, frozen, disabled. Active is a mutable lit reference that is alive. Frozen is a shared reference that is alive. Disabled is any reference that is dead. Let's apply the reasoning principles from the previous slide. A mutable reference represented by active must allow reads and write accesses. Therefore, it must tolerate both child reads, it stays active, and child writes, it stays active. A shared reference represented by frozen must allow read accesses, but forbid write accesses because you cannot write through a shared reference. So frozen will stay frozen when it detects a child read, and it will trigger immediately UB when it sees a child write. And any attempt to use a dead pointer is immediate UB. So any child access for, for a disabled is undefined behavior. With similar kinds of reasonings, we can think about what how our pointer should react to foreign accesses. For example, a foreign read is the indication that someone else has claimed shared access of the data. So a mutable reference can no longer claim to be mutable because it no longer has exclusive ownership. So it's an active gets demoted to frozen. A mutable reference gets demoted to a shared reference. A shared reference can let other shared references exist, so frozen is unaffected by foreign reads. And of course, if a reference is dead, it doesn't change uh, if you use some other reference. And when a foreign write occurs, it is the sign that someone else elsewhere in the program has claimed exclusive access, and you can no longer have any permission other than disabled. So that's how we, in general, reason about what, how our permissions should evolve, depending on what guarantees we want our pointers to have. This very simple model that I've just shown you with just for active, frozen, disabled is not sufficient yet. But it is interesting to observe that it already enforces a lot of the interesting properties that we want from uh, a tool that is to not replicate one-to-one, -one, but about approximate the behavior, the job of the borrow checker. So with the simple model, uh, with just active, frozen, disabled, we are already enforcing that mutable references can be read and written to, but shared references are only readable. We are already enforcing that mutable references have exclusive ownership, and we can guarantee that shared references point to immutable data. We are not trying to mimic one-to-one -one the behavior of the borrow checker. In particular, the borrow checker will not demote a mutable reference to a shared reference when a foreign read occurs, whereas tree borrowers will. But that, that's fine. It's okay to be a bit more permissive. There are, unfortunately, still two big issues with the simplified model left presented. And in the next two parts, I will show you how we fix these. And in general, the template for how to fix these issues will be observe what the issue is, what guarantees we are lacking, create a new permission, and then reason about how this permission should interact to apply all the guarantees we want. So here's the first problem with the, the core triplet. There is two-phase borrows um, implemented uh, as a special case of the borrow checker. And two-phase borrows allow a mutable reference passed as a function argument to coexist with shared references as long as no right access occurs. And this is not something that the core triplet active frozen disables allows yet. 
Here's a demonstration of why, for now, this program that should not be UB because it is safe Rust that compiled is declared UB by the simplified model. A new allocation is an active, a shared reborrow is an active, a mutable, uh, uh, sorry, a mutable reborrow is an active, a shared reborrow is a frozen, and also a foreign read for the previously created mutable reborrow, which becomes frozen from active because active plus foreign read is frozen. Now we try to enter the function and it tries to push through a shared pointer, which is undefined behavior. And it should not be. Let's see how we fix that. The intuition here is that two-phase borrows allow mutable borrows to coexist with shared borrows until function entry. We're going to generalize that into mutable references can coexist with shared references until the first write access. If you have a mutable reference and you don't actually write to it, it's about the same as owning a shared reference. And so that's why the new permission we introduced to represent reserved, to represent mutable references not yet written to, um, behaves very similarly to shared references. It has exactly the same behavior for a child read, foreign read, foreign write, with the only exception that it becomes a true mutable reference. It becomes active the first time we try to use it mutably. With this new permission and with its behavior, we can now fix the previous example. A new allocation is still active. Mutable reborrow is reserved until the first write. Shared reborrow is frozen. It is also a foreign read for the mutable reborrow, but reserve tolerates foreign reads. And then we enter the function, we activate the two phase borrow, and everything goes well. This also as a side effect, disables the previously created shared reference. Great. So just by adding reserved to represent mutable pointers not yet written to, we are now able to handle this case. It's still not quite enough because there's a second problem. Um, we are not yet guaranteeing strong enough properties for the no alias LLVM attributes, which Rust C would like to put on function argument references. And essentially, in TreeBorrow's terms, the LLVM attribute no alias says that foreign accesses cannot coexist with child accesses if at least one of these is a right. Here's an example. If you, of, here's an example of why, of why the, the the, the model does, does not properly enforce that for now. If we have a mutable reference and we write to it, we activate it, and then some unknown code might possibly read to the same location. This will turn the active into frozen, but that is not immediate UB for now, as long as we don't attempt to write through it. So this piece of code passes uh, the simplified model, and it does not declare it to be when it should be. So here's how we fix this. If no alias requires us to enforce stronger guarantees of exclusivity during a function call, let's do that manually. We're going to keep track of all function calls that have not ended, keep track of what their arguments were, and manually enforce additional guarantees for these arguments. And this is essentially the same way that stacked borrows solve the same problem. Stacked borrows also has the same notion of protectors. It's implemented a bit differently, but it's the same idea. So when we enter a function, we add a protector to all reference arguments, and this enforces that they do not lose permissions until the end of the function call. And not losing permission is the same as not allowing certain kinds of foreign entities. Um, with the, yeah, we, we also strengthen behavior to, to further guarantee these properties. Here's how the previous example is fixed by the addition of protectors. If um, we have a mutable reference and we activate it, 
and then some unknown function performs a, a foreign read. Um, this will turn the active into frozen, and we have to find it to be B for a protected active to become frozen. And so this code is properly detected as UB. Which means we now enforce enough requirements for no alias, and we can use no alias attributes on function argument references. And about the same reason goes for dereferenceable, which I haven't shown here, but it's essentially the same thing. So I've shown that reserved, active, frozen, disabled, allow us to represent a lot of interesting properties, including guarantees of no alias, uh, no, uh, including uh, with the addition of protectors, they also guarantee no alias. Um, and we've determined how reserved, active, frozen, disabled should react to foreign accesses and child accesses to enforce uniqueness and immutability that we want from them. So now we're done with the simplified version of the model that I'll be using for the, the final few moments of the talk. Um, there are more details, but I'm not going to go into them uh, right now. Let's talk a bit about optimizations and what optimization tree ballers allows. In particular, what let's look at those that stack borrows allows, but tree borrow does not allow. Because remember, I said at the beginning that the more UB you have, the more optimizations we get. We determined that stack borrows was too strict, so we toned down with the undefined behavior a bit. Um, but this also means that we expect to have fewer optimizations possible in tree borrows than in stack borrows. Less UB, fewer optimizations. Here's a very non-exhaustive list of a few, op a few optimizations quite standard. Most of them are reorderings of operations, but there are also some of other types that stack borrows or tree borrows might allow. In particular, the interesting ones are these two, that stack borrows allows and tree borrows does not allow. And so these are optimizations that were lost in the process of making tree borrows more permissive than stack borrows. But also surprisingly, these two optimizations. Um, these two optimizations are possible in tree borrows, but not in stacked borrows. And this does not come from the fact that tree borrows um, is more strict than stacked borrows in some aspect. This comes from the fact that stacked borrows, in fact, has so much UB as to make some optimizations that should be possible impossible. I will show an example of this just a bit later. First, let's warm up with an optimization that both tree borrows and stack borrows allow. We have a mutable reference, and we would like to know if we can permute two operations. And these two operations are going to be a, re a write access to that reference and a function call that might maybe perform a foreign read or write access. We want to reason about the impossibility of it to uh, actually do a foreign read or write in order to know that we can reorder these two operations. So here's how the reasoning goes. X is reserved and protected until we activate it. It is now active and protected. If the function performs a foreign write, X would become disabled. If the function performs a foreign read, X would become frozen, as it is UB for any mutable reference to go from protected active to frozen or disabled. We can assume, by assuming the absence of UB, that in fact, after the function call, X is still active. From the assumption that X is active, we can deduce that the function did not read or write to its location, and deduce thus that it does not interfere with the right access. And so we now have enough information to justify this permutation. We've assumed that the function does not perform read or write accesses. We don't know it because we don't know this, the code of that function, but we can assume by the absence of UB that it doesn't do it. And then we can reorder the two operations. Here's a second example. 
we have a read access to some shared reference. We know it's protected, so we know it cannot become disabled. However, um, the, the problem here, what, what's hidden here, is that maybe opaque does not terminate. And if opaque does not terminate, this means that the read access is, never, is not reachable. If the read access is not reachable, how do we guarantee that the reference stays writable? And here, protectors save us because it is UB for a reference to become disabled from frozen if it is protected. So thanks to the presence of a protector, we can assume that the reference does not become disabled, deduce that if it does not become disabled, then opaque does not perform a foreign write. And if it does not write, we can safely move the read above opaque because it does not interfere. That's it for optimization we can do. There are a lot more that I'm not going to do, go into all of them. Let's move to optimizations we cannot do. Here's an optimization that could be desirable, but that tree borrowers cannot justify. Tree borrowers cannot guarantee that you will be allowed to perform a write access after a function that might not terminate. In particular, you cannot assume after this function call that no foreign read has occurred. And so you cannot assume that the reference is still writable. And in pre borrows, the reasoning has to stop here. That doesn't mean we couldn't strengthen the model to allow this optimization. What would it take? Well, if we strengthen the tree borrows model to write to mutable references on function entry, suddenly it becomes possible. We can now assume that the reference is still active and deduce that the function does not perform a foreign access. And with this strengthened model, we can justify the speculative read. So what would be the price to pay for this extra optimization? Because each optimization that gain is a code pattern lost. Well, this is a very common pattern that we call the asmute PTR pattern because it usually comes up uh, in the form of asmute PTR. If we search for the term asmute PTR in the error logs of true bars and stack bars, it comes up a lot. Here's the basic idea behind this example. Asmute PTR is just a reborrow function. It doesn't actually perform a right access. So it takes a mutable reference, it returns a raw pointer, but it leaves everything reserves. It doesn't activate anything. And then we can do other things with the data, like reading from it. And it will still be possible to activate the pointer we got from as an PTR later. However, by strengthening, by attempting to strengthen the model in order to allow speculative writes, we've implicitly allowed Asmute PTR itself to perform speculative writes. And one key property of, of Asmute PTR is precisely that it does not write to the data, it only reborrows. And so this pattern is lost uh, if we want to enable the optimization. And I will show just later, this pattern comes up very often, so it would be very costly in terms of backwards compatibility to enable this optimization. Here's another example of an optimization that we might want to do. Stack borrows and theoretically a strengthened version of tree borrows allow us to move down a write access uh, if we know that a read access occurs later. In baseline tree borrows, we cannot reason about this because it could just be frozen and no longer active after a function call, which would leave read accesses possible, but we cannot re reason about write accesses anymore. If we strengthen the model so that um, mutable references are no longer denoted to shared references on a foreign read, this optimization becomes possible. We can now reason about 
um, the absence of any resource right in the function pool, and we can move the, re the right access down. So what's the cost to pay for this? It happens that the price we have to pay would be reordering of read-only operations. This is an optimization we absolutely should be able to do. It is trivially correct for any compiler that does not contain UB to reorder um, read-only operations. Unfortunately, while this is possible with the model I've presented, it would not be possible if we strengthen the model to allow the optimization that we, uh, this, this specific optimization. Because um, the foreign read would make the, uh, the pointer turn from active to disabled immediately. And once it is disabled, you cannot even read anymore. So one key property of tree borrows is that a read access never invalidates another read access. And this allows tree borrows to be able to justify all read read reorderings, which is something that stack borrows cannot do, and which is something that if we wanted to allow this additional optimization in tree borrows, it could no longer allow. So it's not that tree borrows cannot justify all these as, uh, optimizations. We know how we could do this. It's just that I'll show right afterwards that the price to pay in exchange for those optimizations is code patterns that we can no longer write and reordering of read-only operations that we can no longer perform safely without introducing UB. Here's some numerical data that we gathered um, by running MIRI with either tree borrows or stack borrows on the entirety of crates.io, as of at least as of a few weeks ago. Um, here's how to read this chart. Every column corresponds to one kind of undefined behavior detected by MIRI. So uninitialized means that there are that many crates that contain at least one test that violates some properties that uninitialized memory should satisfy. They're going to be reading uninitialized data. The data race column is there are that many crates that exhibit data races. As you can see, the tree borrows column is much shorter than the stacked borrows column. There are a lot fewer crates uh, on crates.io that violates tree borrows assumptions than there are that violate stack borrows assumptions. So in that sense, we have fulfilled the purpose of tree borrows to be more permissive than stack borrows. It is more than three times, uh, it, it, it flags less than three times less EV in crates.io. Um, you can read this chart as the amount of backwards compatibility that would be broken if we rolled out optimizations that use the assumptions of either of these uh, kinds of undefined behavior. Um, so yes, stack borrows is more than twice as likely than uninitialized memory to cause undefined to cause bugs in in people's crates, um, and tree borrows is a lot less likely than that. So in that sense, we we succeeded um, in our goal of of creating a more permissive model. If we break the data down a bit further, um, most of the gain is in allowing being more permissive in when accesses are allowed. We divide by about half the amount of undefined behavior. But more, even more importantly, um, allowing accesses outside of the range of tree borrows. I haven't gone into the details of that, but tree borrows is a lot more permissive than stack borrows in what range he considers as valid for a pointer to access. And most of the game is in these two kinds of undefined behavior. In fact, all the crates I listed earlier exhibit one of these two kinds. So all of Tokyo, Power 3, Arivex, Lotmap, et cetera, they would be incompatible with stacked borrows. They would, it would break backwards compatibility if stacked borrows was enforced, but they are compatible with tree borrows. We can compile those crates without any risk of miscompilation. 
So in that sense, tree borrow has fulfilled its goal of being more permissive than stack borrows, and we can we have direct measurement of that in the amount of UB that we find on crates.io. And in particular, this has been done through the complete elimination of out of bounds undefined behavior, because tree borrow uses lazy initialization to be a lot more permissive with uh, pointer bounds. We do know of some patterns that are allowed by stacked borrows and disallowed by tree borrows. Our measurements show that these are extremely rare and experience shows that they are easy to patch. That's all, thank you for your attention. Uh, there are still a lot of things I haven't talked about, but if you want to ask any questions, feel free to. Um, otherwise you can um, find the slides uh, and the code examples on GitHub. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Nevin, for the great talk, I think on a subject that is near and dear to a lot of people's hearts here, or at the very least uh, to their work. Um, so as Nevin said, if there are any questions, I think this would be the perfect time to take them. Uh, and if people are still, uh, you know, working through it. Oh, hi, Sasha. Hello. Uh, well, I had two questions, but you answered the first one with your last slide. I was going to ask if you have uh, any more material available, and you do. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. And let me find the other question that I took down. Yeah, out of the UBs that are still triggered uh, with tree borrows in the crates you've analyzed, do you know? Here. Yeah. Do you yes. know how many of those are anyway allow VM uh, undefined behaviors? Like, are any of those things that you believe should pass, like, don't seem too absurd to write as Rust code or? Like, would you like tree borrow to um, be in a better world? Would it be more accurate or something in the future? Okay. Um, so I believe that the the general view is that some people would like actually tree borrows to be more strict. At least that's what I've seen on on the the Rust Discord. Um, I haven't looked in detail at that much of the tree borrows. Uh, examples from here, but all of most of them are also stack borrows undefined behavior, and most of them do something clearly very wrong. So yeah, at, at some point, it's clearly it's clearly a bug. Um, okay. If you have if you have two mutable references to the same data and you use them, ultimately, yeah. For example, yeah, yeah, um, exactly. That's a bug. That's not a failure of either tree borrow or stack borrow. It's not to handle. So so can we hope for a Miri that's accurate with respect to the actual semantics of Rust in the future? I mean, is this, are we get, I mean, we're getting closer, obviously, but do you think that's going to happen soon? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the actual semantics. Um, Let, let's say something official that's Rust, because right, right now Miri, okay. Miri is, it, you know. Right, yes, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. So Miri is an over pro uh, yeah, Miri is an over approximation. Uh, in that there are a lot more things that are UB in Miri than what the compiler actually exploits. Um I I haven't I it's it's not my call to make of when any of these assumptions will be used in the actual compiler. Um but People I've talked about seem seem hopeful about that. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. So we have a few other questions in the chat. So Bastian uh, asked, "Do we have rough perf uh, rough data for how perf we lose by forbidding preemptive rights? If it is meaningful, would it be feasible to I don't know change protectors to require active only if the function is directly accessing the pointer?" Yes, okay, um, that's a great question. So that ties back to some debate that started with stack borrows, but that was not made obsolete by tree borrows. It's still, still relevant. Um, here is a 
possible path towards allowing this kind of optimization. Um, we would need to distinguish uh, as need PTR and, and other functions that perform similar things in some sense um, by making them take a different kind of pointer. So if the star self or star mute self um, pattern becomes allowed, that would be uh, a way for methods to take a raw pointer as a first argument. We could write on function entry to mutable references. And we could make as mute PTR take a raw pointer um, as it's the first argument of the method call. And this would allow us to have both this pattern and um, write access on function entry, which enables the corresponding optimization. But, but they would need to be distinguished in some way um, at the Rust source code level, or at least at the, at the mirror level. That makes sense. Um, there's another question from V who asks, does each access of a reference touch the entire tree or do protectors limit the access to a subtree? That's, yes, so that's a major performance concern. Um, each access does indeed need to modify the entire tree. Um, on every memory location, on every pointer of the allocation, um, and even on pointers that don't, that aren't explicitly reborrowed on this range of memory, since we want to allow, since we want to be more permissive with memory ranges. So this is an appearance, a major uh, performance issue. We solve this in several different ways. We have lazy initialization that lets us get away with a bit more on outside the range. We have a great uh, tag garbage collector, um, which you should use if, you're, if the project you use Mary is, is with is in any way significantly big. And so the tag garbage collector helps a lot. Um, and there, there are neat optimizations we can do to trim traversal. So this is what I'm alluding to in the last slide. We can trim tree traversals. Here's the observation. If you have a, an active and you make it see a foreign read, it will become frozen. And then frozen no longer reacts to foreign read. It stays frozen on foreign reads. And it happens that this property of applying the same kind of access twice is the same as applying once. Every, every access is idempotent, holds for every permission. So by keeping track of which subtrees we've propagated which accesses in, into, uh, we can trim most of the tree traversal. We'll, we'll basically have to traverse the tree entirely only once, and then we'll be able to trim the traversal extremely efficiently um, by not applying the same, um, the same access twice. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, well, is this documented somewhere? I yes. can find the link on the on the slide that's currently up. <laughs> um, it is documented in the complementary material. I believe there's a couple of lines about that. Um, it is, of course, documented inside Miri. Um, there's an entire, yeah, an entire function whose whose job is only to optimize tree traversals. Um, and it is documented inside that. There are also assertions inside Mary that the um, permissions actually satisfy this property that all accesses are idempotent. So you, we can't break this optimization by modifying the permissions a bit accidentally. All right, I think if there are no further questions, we might bring things to a close. 
But thank you very much, Nevin. Uh, I think this was a very interesting talk and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing this work continue, especially the formalization. Yes, thank you. All right.